week. Hi, Manucha. We did meet last week, Hanukkah. I presume some people weren't on because of Hanukkah and all the different festivities of Hanukkah, but Baruch Hashem, we did meet, and that was great. And we started last week, chapter 14. Now, in chapter 14, we are discussing, there's a long-range vision. The long-range vision is, be a Benoni. You're not going to get there tomorrow, but keep working. God will give you enough time, you'll get there. What does it mean to be a Benoni? It means absolute commitment. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, I'm focused, I'm God-oriented, I'm disciplined, I don't space out. I don't like give in to weakness and exhaustion. I don't allow myself to feel pressured. I am a joyous, God-oriented individual with absolute discipline, absolute self-control. Sounds great. And it's really possible for every one of us with a lot of work. The problem is work takes time. What do I do today? Today I'm challenged and I have a long-term goal and maybe it's gonna take me a year, maybe it's gonna take me five years, maybe it's gonna take me 25 years. That's fine, God says, as long as every day you're working up your ladder, that's awesome. But what do I do today when I'm challenged? So the Rebbe begins this chapter by giving us three thoughts to think. And these are the thoughts we're supposed to pull out of our toolbox when we are challenged. Now, to make them work, you can't, begin developing them when you're challenged. You know, when you're in the crisis, that's not the time to meditate and contemplate and get into this whole thought to convince yourself. So you need to do the work in advance. Like you need to do the work now after class, you're sitting, hopefully life is quiet and peaceful and it's too late for people to harass you. And you can think and really develop these thoughts as things very, very strong very clear in your brain. Then when you're in the crisis, you just like remind yourself and boom, it comes out because you took the time to develop it when you're not in crisis. So again, if you're, if you're struggling with a temptation, that's not when you want to develop this, 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 this understanding. You want to develop it when everything's theoretical, when you're sitting in your dining room chair, when you're comfortable and calm and focused and really feeling that your desire is God, that's when you develop it. And then when you're in the challenge, you can pull on it and it will be there for you. So last week we spoke about the first and we sort of started, but didn't get too far, I think in the second. So the first thought that you're going to think is when you're challenged by doing something wrong. Now, of course, there's a myriad of things that could be wrong and everyone on their level has what's their wrong that they battle with. Meaning most of us have loads of things under our belt. We would never dream of doing them, not an issue. If it comes up, it's not a challenge. Of course, we're not gonna do it. And then we all have that arena of difficulty. I have it, you have it, every single one of us in this group has those things that challenge them. Now we can all have different things that challenge us, of course, but we all have things that challenge us. So this is in the realm of not doing the wrong. So maybe your challenge is not to eat something not kosher, or maybe your challenge is to eat something not kosher, or maybe your challenge is to eat something without, you know, the extra fancy kosher certifications, or maybe your challenge is not to allow yourself to say something inappropriate or to say something disrespectful or to say something that's gossip, just to say something not exactly true. Or... So we all challenge. Let me challenge different things. We're all challenged. Trust me, we're all challenged. So what do you tell yourself when you when you when your your you know sensors go up, when your antennas go up, when there's like, uh 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 oh, I really am about to do something that I know God doesn't want, but it's really hard. You say, no, stop. I can't sin because a sin separates me from God and I don't want to be separated from God. That's the short, sharp message you tell yourself. I can't sin. I don't want to sin because I don't want to be separated from God and a sin separates. Now, there's a lot of philosophy behind these words, but all that philosophy, again, you're not thinking when you're in the trenches. You're thinking that when you're in a class, when you're developing yourself, 
And then when you're in the trenches, you just pull on the thought and then all the energy behind it will come with. And we explain that there are many, many different levels of meaning, all of which are true, all of which are concurrent realities. What does it mean? I don't want to sing because the sin separates. We said the, the most fundamental concept, which we will discuss at length in later chapters of Tanya, is that every time a person transgresses for the duration of the sin, the sin might last for 25 years, the sin might last for five seconds, for the duration of the sin, the person is further from God than anything in all creation. There is nothing further from God than a sinning Jew because we're God's child. God loves us so much. And therefore, when we sin, it's so, so, so painful for him. And because it's so painful, he pushes us really far. It's really painful experience. It's really hurtful. It's really like spitting in his face. And he pushes us so far because we should be so close. The second the sin is over, he pulls us back. That doesn't mean we repented. It doesn't mean the transgression is removed. It just means that as long as we're not in the act of defiance, in the act of rebellion, he wants to draw us as close as possible. But the sin separates because for as long as I'm in that state of sin, as long as I'm chewing and munching on this food that's not kosher or saying these words that are not kosher or thinking these thoughts that are not kosher or doing this action that's not kosher, God says, no, 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 no. I need you as far away as possible. And even further than that, because it's so painful for me to experience my child doing this. I think we can all relate. I mean, I can say for myself, I sort of think metaphorically, like I'm a teacher, a teacher of teenagers. Teenagers can be quite challenging. And I'm a mother of many children that can be quite challenging. But with my child is doing the exact same thing my student is doing, it hurts so much more. And I have to really like control myself and say, pretend they're my student because then I'll know how to deal with them because then I can be dispassionate because then I have a little bit more perspective. So I know the right thing. But if I lose it because this is my kid, then I won't behave as professionally and I'll probably do something wrong. So when your child is hurting you, it hurts a lot more than when someone else in your world is hurting you, even though that hurts also. It hurts, you, can get, you can get hurt by your students, definitely. But it hurts much more if it's your own child. So when a Jew is sinning, this hurts God so much. We're his kid. We're his only child. And we're defying him. We don't care about him. We're rebelling against him. We're tossing him off. We're saying he's irrelevant to our life. That really, really, really is like hurts and such a deep gut-wrenching experience. And therefore, we're as far from God as can be during the moments of sin. And again, when the sin is over, he pulls us back close. For the duration of sin, we're very, very far. So that's one level of meaning a sin separates. There are others. The sin itself causes this like barrier, a film of evil to encase our soul, which doesn't allow the godly energies of the soul to express outward, which doesn't allow the soul to take in God's energy. There's a Kabbalistic concept referred to as in Hebrew, which means the absorption, the kidnapping and absorption from the forces of evil, of the godly energy. Every Jew is constantly receiving a very special energy called Hevel Ha'elion, God's breath, blown into us constantly, his breath, his inner self. And when one sins, that blessed breath is sabotaged, it's kidnapped, and it's feeding the forces of evil instead. So there are many, many levels and what this means, a sin separates. And I don't want to be separated. But if I think of all this, when I can calmly focus and delve and really create this thought as a very real force inside of me, then when I'm in trouble, I can just pull it out. Because I developed it at length when I wasn't in trouble. So it's very strong. It's a very strong road in my brain. So now I just remind myself of it and boom, all the energy, all the force of that thought is now saying, no, 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 no. You cannot do this transgression. It's not worth it. Not worth it. Not worth it. 
and I overcome and I don't do it. So that's the first tool. The second tool, which is the corollary of that, is a mitzvah, fulfilling God's will, the commandment, connects, and I want to be connected. So the same way that I'm so scared of separation, I so deeply, deeply want this relationship with God. That's the most essence desire of my soul. And my soul is me. The real me is my soul. I've got a lot of other layers around. But if I get into my core reality, my core reality is soul. That is me. And my soul has as her only and essence desire, a deep need to be one with God. Why? Because we love God. And if you love someone, you want to be with them. And if you love someone, you want to give to them. And I and every one of us absolutely love God. And therefore, I want to be with God, which is only possible through serving him, through the Torah, through the mitzvah. And I want to give to God, which is only possible through the Torah and through the mitzvah. So therefore, the absolute truth of my existence is I want, need, must have God which is only possible by serving him, only possible by Torah mitzvahs. So again, when I think about this several times, it's not like, okay, I thought about it, let me move on. No, keep revisiting that thought. Revisiting that thought when you're not tempted <laughs> to do anything wrong. Just keep revisiting the thought to make it stronger and stronger and stronger and more and more internalized. I know some people like can't handle rereading a novel <laughs> or relearning something they learned already. But it's a very powerful tool to relearn what you've already learned. Because each time as you learn it again, it gets deeper and deeper. Oh, that's what it means. And you can come back to it and have another oh moment. Because each time it becomes more and more you. It's not just some external idea that you understand. More and more and more, it becomes your thinking. And when it's really your thinking and you're challenged, because for whatever reason, it's difficult to do the right thing, you just tap on that button in your brain, tap on that thought, and it comes out with a lot of power. I must do this. This is an opportunity. This is a mitzvah. A mitzvah connects. I want to be, I need to be connected. So these are short messages you tell yourself when you're in trouble. You tell yourself when you're going to slip into the transgression. No, nope. no, nope. I don't do that. I do not allow myself to be separated from God. A sin separates, I'm not being separated. And when you can't build up the motivation or there's a lot of difficulties in doing the right thing, sometimes, of course, we all want to do the right thing. And yet we don't always do the right thing because it's not always so easy. <clears throat> sometimes it's very hard to do the right thing. Sometimes there's a lot of reasons why it's not so practical to do the right thing. Sometimes it's very expensive to do the right thing. Expensive in terms of money, expensive in terms of time, expensive in terms of efforts, expensive in terms of relationships. There a lot of reasons why you won't do the right thing, even though, of course, you only want to do the right thing. So when you're in that challenge and you remind yourself, a mitzvah connects, I want to be connected. I'm going for this. I must do this. It'll get you over that hump as you're growing in your long-term goal of becoming that Bainerini. It will get you over that like challenge of the moment. Any questions on this so far? <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, so let's continue. So we just said we're talking about the thoughts we think to keep from falling when we're on the long-term journey, but there's bumps on the road. If you're tempted to do the wrong, you remember the transgression separates and I can't be separated. If it's challenging to do the right, you remember the mitzvah connects and I need to be connected. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. Sure. So, so when you say to do the wrong, I, I'll give you an example. So, you know, I know I have to do my chitat and the best thing is in the morning. Yes, so it's not like I'm learn. going to do something bad, like I'm going to walk or cook or something. So I will push away the chitat 
for sometimes too late and sometimes even, you know, oh, I get too tired and I go to sleep and I didn't do it. You know what I mean? And I know when I do it, how I feel and how my day goes. Um, sorry, I hope you can all hear me. For some strange reason, my, my camera keeps going off. Yeah, we can see, we can hear you, but we cannot you can hear see me. You. Not see me, and I can't figure out why. Something to do with my settings. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm just uh, something to do with this camera I'm using. Let me take it off. Okay, now we okay. can see you. Yeah. So not as well. It's sort of blurry. But um, at least you can see me. Um, Try to clean it a little. I have a, a separate webcam, and for some reason, it decided not to function now. All right, good. Sorry for the distraction. So, Rachel, continue your question. So, you know, the best thing is to say yechitas in the morning. It is the best, by the way. That's what our sages say. We are our, our daily schedule, and it's difficult. I find it incredibly challenging. But our daily mm-hmm. schedule is supposed to be: we're supposed to in the morning, first thing pray and then after our prayers before we do anything else though everything is calling our name in the morning we're supposed to study torah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and only then we're supposed to continue on our day so rachel either knew this or realized on her own that that's the best time to learn and she's absolutely right and then what happens so things will come up i get a text that i need to respond to i get the call i get you know Life. And so yeah, then I push life. it, and then it just gets so far, farther, farther away, you know. And just to, re- I guess, so, well, no, you were saying about doing the wrong thing. Here, I'm not doing anything that I'm going to sin, Chalila, but I'm not doing the right thing. Exactly. So that's a perfect example of what I meant before. I said that there are myriads of levels of challenge. Mm-hmm. So Rachel is giving us a very refined challenge, but it's definitely a challenge. In, in that situation, are you supposed to think that the cinch separates and I don't want to be separated or the mitzvah connects and I want to be connected? Which one are you supposed to be thinking, Rachel? Well, I think the, to, to be connected. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We're not dealing here with a transgression. Mm-hmm. If she chose to do her studying later in the day, she didn't transgress. But there's an opportunity to do the mitzvah now. You could say, okay, so I'm not going to do it now. I'm still definitely going to do it. The day's not going to go by that I'll miss it. I'll still do it. True, but there's a different quality to doing it right away after you finish your prayers. That's exactly when God wants you to study is right after your prayers. Now, again, if you have a number of things you study and you can't do all of them in the morning, that's fine. If you can't do any of them in the morning, that's also fine. But yes, if Russell's pattern is to do it in the morning, but she's challenged every morning with his pattern, then this is your challenge. And this is exactly where you're supposed to say, no, the mitzvah connects and I need to be connected. I need to start my day with Tyra. I need to start my day with godliness. I'll learn it much better now. My head is fresher. When I'm in the middle of things, I'm going to be doing it much faster, much less concentrated. And here it has the opportunity to flavor my entire day with Torah, with godliness. I need to do this now. And everything else has to wait. It's a great idea. I'm not currently doing it, but maybe Rachel's question will remind me to to do this, which is to um, not turn on my phone until after I finish uh, both, both praying and studying. It's a big challenge because there's always some reason you have to turn on your phone. But what I usually do is maybe I have to look at certain things. I look at them and then I shut my phone off until after. Um, but you know, I'm not always as religious about it as I should be. And it's very true. The phone is definitely one of the many ways that we're being pulled away from what we're supposed to be doing. But yes, that's a perfect example. I want to be connected and for me, on my level, I should be studying now. And therefore, if I'm not, it's a problem for me. And maybe for someone else, it would be not a problem at all. But if you already are on the level and are aware that that's what you should be doing, yes, it is a problem to be doing it later. Okay, thanks. Sure. Anyone else? Any other questions on that? 
and any of the ideas we were discussing? Okay, anyone else? Okay, so let's continue now with the third thought. So the first is the sin, the transgression separates and I don't wanna be separated. The second is the mitzvah connects and I want to be connected. And now for the third thought, there's a little longer than the other two. In the Tanya, I'm page 38, and I'm on two, four, six, eight, nine, eight and a half lines from the bottom. The filu kal shebekalim, and even the lowest of the low. Yocho limser nafshal kedushas Hashem is willing to sacrifice his life for the sanctification of God. And I'm surely not lower than him. The only thing with this lowest of the low guy is he has the spirit of folly, a.k.a. his evil inclination. And it appears to him that with this transgression, he's still complete Jew. And his soul is not cut off from God. And he has another problem. He forgets the natural love hidden in his heart for God. I don't want to be a fool like him and deny the truth. <laughs> um, all right. So what is this thought? What is this thought? This thought is saying, this is a little bit more complicated because there's a few parts to it. But the basic thought, I'll first give you the, the stripped down basic thought and then I'll give you it more fleshed out. The most basic thought is, even the lowest of the low will sacrifice himself for God and I'm surely not lower than that. It's like pulling on your Jewish positive pride, your godly sense of self. You know, sense of self is a very delicate thing because it could lead to a lot of ego. But there's also a godly sense of self. I'm a piece of God. I'm God's only child. God invests in me all of his powers and all of his strength, which means that I'm incredibly capable. But I could look at a Jew who, for whatever reason, seems very challenged. I'm not judging him. I'm not judging. I don't know his background. I don't know his challenges, his inner challenges, his outer challenges, but he seems very challenged. He's what the Tanya calls the lowest of the low. And yet this Jew, who's the lowest of the low, again, I haven't seen him personally, this uh, person I know, but I know in general, every Jew, even the lowest of the low, will die for God. Now, that concept is developed at length later in Tanya, in chapter 18. And it's something that the Rebbe puts a lot of emphasis on to express the uniqueness of the Jewish soul and how embedded in our soul is such a deep love for God that it's very hard for us to deny his existence. And the proof for this that the Altar Rebbe develops there is that Judaism is the only religion, it's the only faith, it's the only creed where people that don't live for it will still die for it. Meaning every religion, it doesn't have to be religion, every ideology has martyrs. Being a martyr is not uniquely Jewish. But Judaism is the only place where martyrdom is accomplished not by only the stellar members of society. Meaning Jews that seemingly didn't care about God, Jews that seemingly didn't serve God have given up their life for God. And unfortunately, we've had countless opportunities to see this in action, and we've seen it again and again and again. So why? Why would a Jew who doesn't keep Shabbos and doesn't keep kosher and doesn't seem to care about the fact that he's a Jew, why would he give up his soul for God? Why would he give his life for God? Because deep, deep in the Jew, in every Jew, is such belief in God and such love of God that when there actually comes that horrific moment of the ultimate challenge to his existence, it like smashes through all the barriers he's accrued over a lifetime 
touches straight to the core of his soul, shatters that core so much that the pure belief and love and fear and devotion and self-sacrifice for God comes pouring out. And this Jew that didn't live for God dies for God. So that is like a classical situation. So when the person is thinking this thought, they're not thinking of anybody specifically they know, because thank God we live in America in the 21st century, and we probably don't know not a devout Jew and not a lowest of the low Jew who died for God. Maybe we can think of examples. We can, of course, think of examples, unfortunately, even today. But that is not in our common world. But we know this to be true. This is a fact of our people's existence. So as such, I know that lowest of the low, I'm not thinking of anyone specific here, just the concept. I know that lowest of the low person has countless times died for God. Well, I'm not lower than him. I mean, I might have a high self-esteem, I might have a low self-esteem, but I'm not lower than the lowest of the low. I don't think of myself like that. So if he's willing to die for God, surely I can live for God. Well, then why wasn't he living for God? He's the one that died for God. He should be the one living for God. So the Bible says there's two reasons why he's not living for God, even though he's dying for God. And these two reasons are the two classical strategies of our evil inclination. The Rebbe here doesn't say evil inclination. He uses a different term. He calls it the spirit of folly. This is based on the saying of our sages that a Jew only sins because a spirit of folly enters into him. A person only sins because a spirit of folly enters into him and makes him foolish and makes him buy a foolish line of reasoning and transgress. Now that spirit of folly is our evil inclination. It's like the voice of our evil inclination. So what were the two messages the Rebbe said this person is receiving? So the first message is, he says, this is again the thought process of the lowest of the low, that persona who did gullibly swallow the evil inclinations logic. He said, eh, this transgression won't hurt me. I'm not going to be cut up from God by it. Now, there are many different ways to say this. We're probably all familiar with this logic because all of our evil inclinations go to the same schools. So they pick up the same tips. So it goes something like, this isn't going to hurt me. Something like, everyone does it. Something like, God doesn't really care about this. Something like, God forgives. Something like, God doesn't expect more from me. Something like, even really orthodox people do this. So for sure, I can. You know, there's lots of different ways of window dressing, but the essence thought is the transgression will not harm me. That is the essence thought. This transgression will not harm me. There's many different words we can say, but every time we sin, our evil inclination is convincing us, this isn't going to hurt you. You think God punishes? You think he's going to punish for this? Look at all your friends that are far more religious than you. They all do this. It's not a big deal. Everyone does this. What do you think? You're a rabbi? Maybe the rabbis don't do this. You're not a rabbi. Like, well, well, who are you fooling? You do so many things worse. Why shouldn't you do this? You know, well, you can think through your own thoughts or watch your thoughts. You'll find it. We all have different packaging, different window dressing around this thought. The thought is, this isn't going to hurt me. That's one side of the spirit of folly, evil inclinations, seductive logic. There's something else he tells you. If you look in the time, the other thing is, you don't really love God that much. You love God? I love God. I don't know if I love God. I don't even know if I believe in God. I don't even know. Maybe I do believe in God, but I don't know if it's really real. Maybe it's a sort of belief. I don't know if it's really love. What difference does it make? Again, anything along those lines is all coming from this basic point of, I have this love inside of me pushing me to connect. So it's not going to hurt me. And I have no real motivation to do the right. I'm not worried about the wrong. I have no motivation to do the right. Okay, sin, here I come. So what the Reb is saying by going into this logic is to, under, is to explain to us, so why is it that a Jew 
dies for God and doesn't live for God. That's such a bizarre concept. Now, a person could say, no, I mean, listen, giving up your life is just one time. Living for God is like every second of your existence. But it's a little foolish because in the end of the day, sacrificing your life for most of us is, is our life. It's gone. That's it. That's everything. We're not talking about how painful the end will be. Just the very fact that you're giving up everything, that's it, you're done, is the most incredible sacrifice a person could ever do. So it really is strange. We don't think of it as strange because we know it as a historical truth. We know many Jews that didn't live for God died for that. So we accept it as such. But they're ever saying it's sort of strange because if they're so willing and they love God so much and they're so scared of transgression that they give up their life, why didn't they just live for God? And they're ever saying for these two reasons, meaning throughout their entire life, they were buying in to the seductive voice of their evil inclination called the spirit of folly, which said, eh, this isn't going to hurt you. And I don't love God anyway. I don't really love God. Maybe I love God a little. I don't love God enough to give up my desires. I don't love God enough to do what he wants when I want differently. And anyway, it's not going to hurt me. I mean, why would it hurt me? God doesn't hurt. God's a kind God. I mean, if I serve him, he'll give me more. But if I don't serve him, he just won't give me as much. But that's okay. I'm willing to forgo it. You know, all this garbage we tell ourselves. So these two tactics of the evil inclination, the transgression won't harm, and I don't love God anyway, so why am I motivated to serve him? The person accepted and swallowed and digested and regurgitated, and that kept him on the track of sin for his whole life until he came to this moment where his whole existence was challenged. And that essence challenge, are you a Jew or not? Are you willing to sacrifice God or not? Woke up his soul. It was like violently shaken. It just woke up. And then he's like, what? I love God. I believe in God. What are you talking about? Of course, I'd rather give up my life than give up God. Forget about my past 10 or 30 or 50 years of existence. That's all garbage. I am a believer. I love God. And no way are you taking my God away from me. And he sacrifices his life for God. That's him. What am I telling myself? This person is willing to give up his life for God. I'm surely not lower than him because he's the lowest of the low. But I don't want to be a fool like him because he was really a fool. Why is he a fool? Because he gave up his life for God, but he didn't live for God. He loves God and believes in God enough to give up his life, but he didn't give up his cheeseburger or he didn't give up his juicy gossip or he didn't give up his not modest attire, or he didn't give up his not coffee stroll coffee, whatever it was. He wasn't willing to give up the daily details for God because he was operating on a superficial, superficial level of self. But when it came to the crux core of self, of course, he would give up everything for God. So how do we take all these ideas and make it a message? Because there's a lot of things I just said, and the Rebbe's point is, he wants it to be a message you can pull out like this. So the message, but you have to understand all this detail. And I'm willing to take questions on the detail because I threw out you a lot of information. But the message goes something like this. This is, again, you could use this message in either situation. If you're challenged to do the wrong or if you're challenged to not do the right, because this message works for both situations. Even the lowest of the low sacrifices his whole life for God. And I'm no lower than him, but thank God I'm not such a fool like him because I don't just want to die for God. I want to live for God. Now, this logic, if I'm willing to die for God, surely I'm willing to live for God. The Reb will come back to a number of times in the Tanya, meaning it's, it's a concept the Reb really wants us to integrate. If I'm willing to die for God, Surely I'm willing to live for God. Or if you want to put it another way in your head, you could just think to yourself, take whatever your challenge is <laughs> and say, if I'm willing to die for God, I could give up my bad mood for God. If I'm willing to die for God, I could give up my overwhelmed, stressed feeling for God. If I'm willing to die for God, I could give up this food choice that I know he doesn't approve of for God. 
If I'm willing to die for God, I could give up this negative emotion for God. If I'm willing to die for God, I could give up the that which is distracting me from my prayers for God. Just fill in the blank, whatever the issue is. If I'm willing to die for God, surely I'm willing to live for God. That's the Rebbe's logic. And again, in the framework of reference of this lowest of the low, the even stronger message here is he's willing to die for God. I sure hope I'm willing to live for God. Okay, any questions on this? Can I ask you a question? Sure. It's a little bigger commitment to say I'm willing to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> but it's ultimately a smaller commitment than throwing away your life for God. Again, what does throwing away your life mean? It means the end of your relationship with your husband on this world, the end of being the mother for your children, the end of being the daughter for your parents, the end of like, it's, it's not like, okay, so I just checked out of this world. I mean, what does that mean? There's nothing bigger than that. There's no bigger moment than that. Because a lot of times, and that, that's why I tried to say that, but I probably didn't say it clearly enough. A lot of times we think, okay, so he died. So that was how, how, how maybe, maybe it was torturous. So let, let's say it wasn't so torturous. It was a minute, me, every second I'm battling with myself not to be nasty. And in one minute you attain all your glory. But if you think what that decision means, Again, in the situation when Jews were given a choice, and there were many times when they weren't given a choice, and many Jews died for God without a choice, and there were many times when they weren't given a choice. Many, many, many times in our history, Jews were given a choice. The choice might have been the cross, the choice might have been the Quran, you know, there were different choices. But there were many times where Jews were given a choice. And traditionally, almost every time the Jew chose God, which includes Jews that weren't so godly. And that's the Alter Rebbe's point. The Alter Rebbe is saying a Jew chooses God when it comes down to it. I agree with you that obviously in the moment when you're exhausted and didn't have any normal food and have a lot of things on your plate, it's hard to be focused and centered and like the only core of my life and the only thing that matters is God. Because we're, we're, we're broken down and distracted by the distractions of exile, of Gullus. but the Rebbe is saying, but if you could focus, if you could remember your priorities, if your priority is such that you would give up your life for God and you would, does it make more sense to live for God? That's, that's, that's the message the Alter Rebbe is saying. And, and I agree, it's not, a, it's not a simple message because in essence, if somebody's life is on the line, their soul powers almost like overwhelm them. And when it's you and you're trying to stay calm and joyful and positive with your children in the morning, it's really, you know, you, you got to really pull it out of yourself. But we have the abilities inside ourselves, And if we just can keep focusing on, I want to live for God. I know I would die for God. So like, I don't want to be such a fool and be willing to die, but not be willing to live. If I'm that, if, if I value God so much that I would give him my whole life, I want to give him my life now in, in the flesh as I'm living. Maybe if it's hard to think of it in its entirety, just sort of like someone says, oh my gosh, I can't diet. I can never eat chocolate for the rest of my life. Forget it. Give me a chocolate bar. You know? So maybe you could think of it in terms of like, let me pick one area of weakness. Let me pick that one thing that maybe happens regularly enough that I'll remember it. And in that one area, tell myself in this area, I'm not going to be the fool. I'm willing to die for God. I will live for him by overcoming this challenge. And when I'm in this challenge, I'm going to think this thought. I'd be willing to die for God. I'm going to live for him. And just keep holding that thought as like your anchor to stay strong and focused through that situation. And maybe that's easier than like, you know, transformation of my life, which maybe therefore doesn't happen at all. Maybe if you select exactly the area you want to use this tool for, it could really be very, very, very powerful. The Rebbe's goal in giving us these thoughts is 
as like crutches, as tools to help us overcome the challenge of the moment. This isn't the long term road of becoming Robinson Bainoni. This is the how I don't crash today as I walk my long term road. I'm going to be walking my long term road, working on my love for God, working on my fear of God, working on my discipline for God, working on my focus. But today I'm challenged. I can't wait till I develop it in five years from now because today I got to survive. So these, these thoughts are to keep me going today. Any other questions? Okay. So these were the thoughts. Now the Rebbe says, this as the person who's aspiring to the, be the Benoni, you're confronted with these challenges. You will think these thoughts that you developed at length when you weren't challenged. You'll pull them out when you're challenged and you will overcome as the wannabe potential Benoni. But the Benoni, even when you reach full Benoni glory, still has a lot of junk inside of him. He's just not accessing it. He's not being affected by it. He's overcoming it. But this is not so in terms of that which is given over to the heart, meaning your emotional barometer. To mean to say, that you truly despise evil. The son of a sinna, and you absolutely hate it. Oh, I feel a shallow sinna, or at least you somewhat hate it. That's impossible to truly, truly hate evil. Ella only. By enormous, strong, powerful love of God. Like the Santic's love, the perfect person's love, not the Benoni's love. The Benoni is perfect in terms of his thoughts and his speech and his action. The Santic is perfect inside as well as outside. And he loves God with a love that's a delight. That he feels it. The tzaddik's experience is sort of like the soul's feel in the afterlife. So the Rebbe was saying here. Now the Rebbe perhaps is saying this for us to understand that the Benoni is an accessible status. Because if I would think of the Benoni as... If I would think of the Benoni as, wow, me, absolutely perfect, never do anything wrong, never say anything wrong, never think anything wrong. I mean, that's me, an angel. Well, I don't think I'm going to be an angel anyway. So I don't think this whole thing is very realistic. They're just saying, no, 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 Benoni is very realistic. Trust me, a Benoni could love wrong. He could be so tempted. He could so want it. He just doesn't give in. Now, not every Benoni loves wrong. There's varying levels of Benoni. But it's possible to be so tempted, to be so attracted, to find it so attractive, all the things God says no, and still be a Benoni. Because the Benoni means he's not giving into that. It doesn't mean he doesn't have it. Again, there are Benoni that also don't have it. But we're talking about the basic Benoni. Like, you know... Average Joe Schmo Benoni. He's very tempted. He just doesn't give in. Oh, so he's not so tempted than me. I'm tempted and give in, and he's tempted and doesn't give in. Belcher says exactly. He's not so different than you. You're both tempted. You're both attracted to evil. He just doesn't give in. In other words, if we would think of it like this, regular people see something wrong. And I'm not saying every evil we're attracted to. Obviously, there's some evil that disgusts us. But the evil we're attracted to. Evil means anything God forbids is evil. So anything God forbids that you're attracted to. So that evil that you're attracted to, some of us look at it, we're attracted, and we do it. The Benoni could be very attracted, and he doesn't do it. The imperfect Sadik is not attracted. When the imperfect Sadik looks at that same attractive evil, that I possibly am attracted and sim with, that the Benoni possibly is attracted but doesn't sim with, that imperfect Sadiq looks at it and he's like, it doesn't attract me. I know God doesn't want it, but I could see why it attracts you. 
the perfect tzaddik is not only not attracted to it, he is repelled and disgusted by it. Why is he repelled and disgusted by the very attractive thing? Because he's so in sync with God. And just as God is repelled by evil, that perfect tzaddik is exactly mirroring God. So he's repelled by it. He's not attracted to it. He's not, well, not attracted, but I can see why you'd be attracted. He is repelled and disgusted by it. What creates this disgust? Because he really, really, really loves God. And the more you love God, the more evil, at the least, is a barrier. It's why God's not revealed in this world. It's why people don't sense God. It's why God's in exile. It's why we're all in exile. Ugh, it's disgusting. That's how the tzaddik feels. He's not attracted, but controls himself. He's not understanding why other people be attracted. He is disgusted by it because this is creating the barrier between the world and God. And that's disgusting. And I hate that. That's how the tzaddik feels because he loves God that much. Now the Rebbe says, what's his relationship with God? His relationship with God is the highest love that we know of. Now, we discussed this love in chapter 9. Now we're in chapter 14, so it's possible from 9 to 14, you forgot it. But the term is ahava bita'anugim, which means a love that is a delight. A love that feels really, really good. It feels so good that the altar ever just told us it's like what the souls experience in the afterlife. Meaning when a person passes away from this world, and then perhaps needs some minor purification and rectification, or hopefully doesn't even need that. And he goes to what we call Olam Haba, the world to come, or Gan Eden, the spiritual repository of the souls while they wait for us to get our act together and bring Mashiach. What are the souls doing there? They're having pleasure. They're having pleasure primarily from all the Torah they studied in this world. And they have deep, deep pleasure in feeling God's energy in all of that Torah they studied. That tzaddik in this world feels that pleasure. When he studies Torah in this world, he feels akin to the feeling the souls have in the afterlife from all this Torah they studied when they were in this world. It's an unbelievable feeling. It's an unbelievable love of God coming from an absolute, absolute nullification of self to God. Meaning that tzaddik is so no barriers, nothing. He's completely, he, he surrendered everything to God. He didn't hold anything back. So like there's no separation between him and God. There's no my space between him and God. There's no self between him and God. On this level of this absolute tzaddik, it's complete surrender, complete being subsumed in God's reality. And as such, there's no barriers on his soul. So his soul, when learning Torah, can experience what the souls feel in the afterlife from the Torah they study. That's what he feels in this world. And it feels more of a deep pleasure than anything we ever can experience in this world. And that intense love creates such intense hatred and despising of evil that he's disgusted by it. But the Benoni, even one who's a full-fledged, card-carrying, true Benoni, could possibly, there are different levels of Benoni, but possibly be completely attracted. He just doesn't give in, but he's completely attracted. Which again, the Rebbe is saying and sort of reassuring us that you don't have to be so holy to be a Vainoni. You just have to have a lot, a lot, a lot of self-control and a lot of self-discipline. A lot of staying fixed on your goal. Know what your goal is and don't let yourself lose sight of it. Any questions on this before we move on? Okay. And on this, our sages say, Your world you will see in your lifetime. 
Meaning that Santik in this lifetime sees, experiences the future world, Olam Haba. Now the term Olam Haba, the world to come, could either mean the times of Mashiach or the soul's experience in the afterlife in the state of reward before Mashiach comes. And it's the exact same term used. So you sort of need to see by context. It's a very contextual to understand what it's talking about. So in this case, we mean the soul in the afterlife while waiting for Mashiach to come is in that great, awesome, intense, pleasurable waiting room called Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, and experiencing the godliness of all the Torah he studied his entire lifetime. And that depth of pleasure he's experiencing, the tzaddik, in this world. So olamecha, your worlds, meaning the future worlds, you will see in your current lifetime. That's the tzaddik's experience. And not everyone merits to this. This is like reward. You're in this world, you're doing the work, and you're getting the reward of Gan Eden. And as it's written, it says, Avoidas Matana Etain Eskunaschem. That's a Pasuk in Mamidbar that means the work that's a Matana, that's a present. I will give your Kahuna. So, obviously, on a very practical level, it's the, the gifts of the service of the priests, of the Kohen. But Kabbalistically, allegorically, Kohen refers to love. There's two services, the Kohen, the priest, and the Levi, the Levite. The Kohen, the priest, his, he served God with kindness, with love. The Levi, the Levite, served God with fear, with awe. So avodas matana eten esku naschem, the service, that's a gift. I will give your kuhuna. I will give that level of love of God. Because loving God like that is a gift. Meaning, even the tzaddik, even the most perfect, perfect person who's completely destroyed his evil inclination, whose animal soul is fused with his godly soul, even he only experiences this love because God gifts him with this experience. He doesn't have it either naturally because it is a truly out of this world experience. It is truly a God agent experience that he's experiencing in this lifetime. So even the tzaddik, who is completely subsumed, who is completely nullified, who has no separate existence at all, who is completely saturated with God and that's his whole reality, even he only experiences this love because of God's help, because of the arousal from above that gives him with this experience when he does his work to be completely nullified, to be completely immersed in Torah study. I mean, it's a whole process of many, many steps to attain this level. But in the end of the day, with all of his steps to attain this level, it's a gift of God. Because without God's gift, even he would never have this experience. So bottom line, surely we don't. And as such, we don't have this love. We don't have this fear. We don't have this despising evil. We don't have this hatred of evil. We don't have this disgust of evil. So we're attracted to it, as is the Benoni. So the Benoni can be attracted to evil. So, hey, I'm attracted to evil, and the Benoni is attracted to evil. He doesn't give in, and I sometimes give in. If I could just control myself to not give in, that's the par between me and the Benoni. It's possible. That's what the Rebbe wants you to understand. This is a doable, long road, but a doable road. And now with this understanding, we can answer another question from chapter one. Now we're in chapter 14. We can answer another question from chapter one. The Lachet Amar Eov, and therefore Eov, Job said, Barasa Tzadikim Vachule, God, you created the Tzadikim. We could use the Tikkunim, as it's explained in Tikkun Zohar. There's a section of Zohar. So there are various levels and aspects among the souls of the Jews. Hasidim, 
Giborim, Hamaskarim al Yitzram, some are called Hasidim, those from the energy of kindness, of giving, of love. Some are called Giborim, the strong one, that they overcome their evil inclination, they have strength. Ma'are Saira, luminaries of Torah, Nevi'im, prophets, etc., Tzadikim, etc., Ayin Sham, you can look it up there. So what was the question in chapter one we just answered and what's the answer? So in chapter one, this is one of the questions. This is a question the Rebbe raises, meaning some of the things we are clarifying from chapter one are not literally questions the Rebbe raised, but questions we could derive from the information. This is a literal question. And the question is on something in the book of Eob, of Job. So if you remember the story, either from me having explained it another time or from knowing it yourself, Eov, this might be a true story. This might all be a metaphor, meaning it's it's disputed among the sages if this actually happened, if there actually was a person called Eov, or if this whole thing is a metaphor. It's also disputed if he was a Jew or a non-Jew. It's also disputed when this happened. Some say Eov was a great, great righteous non-Jew that lived shortly before the Jews entered Israel and conquered it, and he passed away shortly before they conquered it. Others say he lived at the time of Avram Avinu. But the story is there was this very, very righteous person, was incredibly righteous, wealthy, many sons, life was great, and he was very righteous. And the forces of evil come to God and say, well, what do you expect? You gave him everything. Take it all away and see how good he'll be. God said, okay. So he lost all his wealth. He lost all his sons. He lost his health. He became sick himself with this contagious disease. I don't think it was corona, but something else. And when people came, three of his friends came to comfort him. They couldn't even sit too close because he was contagious. And they try to comfort him. They each give their philosophical comforts. It's a very sad book. That's why you're actually allowed to learn it on the ninth of all, because it's sad. And, and he's still not comforted. He's not comforted. He's not comforted. He's not comforted. And finally, God himself comes and talks to him. And when God himself is talking to him, Eo, Job, is comforted. And he said, you know what? It's all worth it. Losing my wealth, losing my sons, losing my health. To have this relationship with God, it's all worth it. With that, he passed the test. And at the end of the book, it says very briefly that he got cured and he, retained his, he regained his wealth and he had more children. He passed the test. Now, in his conversation with God, when he's talking to God towards the end of the book, he says, God... You created the righteous. But Rasa Tzadikim. Now we know this is a true statement because God doesn't contradict him and he's talking to God. So if God didn't create the righteous, then God would have said, no, 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 no. You're misunderstanding. Eeyuk. God doesn't say that. So it's true. So this is a statement in the book. But Rasa Tzadikim, you created the righteous. In the Gemara, this statement is question. There's no answer given. It's just a question. And the question is, what was he talking about? What did Eve mean? You create the righteous. God dictates most of our life. God dictates how many seconds we'll live, who we'll marry, how many children we'll have, where we'll live, how we'll live, everything he dictates. There's one thing God doesn't determine. Our sages say, Hakol Everything is in the hand of God's except one thing, fear of God. So everything is predetermined, except my choices, except how much I will allow God into my life. That's my choice. That's what we call Bechir Hafshis. That's the free choice of the Jew. Free choice to do isn't what city you're winding up in, isn't how many children you'll have, isn't who you'll marry, isn't if you'll be healthy or not, isn't if you'll be wealthy or not. You have one thing, free choice. Are you going to be God-fearing or not? And that we freely choose. So wait a minute, the Talmud says. If we freely choose to be God-fearing or not, and that's the only thing we choose, how could he have said, Barasa Tzadikim? You created the righteous. What does he mean? That's the one thing God doesn't create. That's we create by our own choice. So what did he mean? So the Rebbe raised this question in chapter one. The reason why he brought it in chapter one was to cement very firmly that we have no clue what a tzaddik means. Because obviously a tzaddik can't mean God-fearing because we choose if we're God-fearing or not. And yet, Eve is saying, and God's not contradicting, you create the righteous. 
We didn't answer it in chapter one. We just raised it to show that we really are clueless what this term tzaddik means. We don't know what tzaddik means. We don't know what Russia evil means. We surely don't know what Benoni in the middle means. And once we knocked away all our preconceptions, we could absorb the truth about these terms. So now, after everything we learned, the Rebbe's saying is very obvious. When we say now, we can understand that when it says, Baras Tzaddikim, it literally means that you created special certain people with a different type of soul, with the soul of a tzaddik. That does mean a God-fearing person. You could be God-fearing and not be a tzaddik. You could be God-fearing and be a Benoni. You could be less than a Benoni and also be God-fearing. You don't have to, you could be lower than a Benoni and be God-fearing. You could be a Benoni and be God-fearing. But to be a tzaddik, God creates a deacon. Meaning God gives certain souls the ability to be a tzaddik. And to prove his point, the Reb is quoting now from a piece of Zohar that says exactly that. That there are different souls that have different predispositions, different tendencies, different abilities. And some souls are given the ability to be a tzaddik. Now, most of the souls that are given the ability to be a tzaddik are not born tzaddikim. They're born like we're all born with potential and they work on themselves. But since they are given the potential to be a tzaddik, their work can take them far higher than most people's work. And as they keep working and working and working, they can overcome their evil, they can destroy their evil, they can discard their evil, and they can ultimately become a tzaddik, that they have in potential. But someone else who doesn't is not given this potential, however high they work, generally, at the end of this chapter, we'll see an exception to that rule. But for most of them, however high they work, if they weren't given the potential to be a tzaddik, they're not going to be a tzaddik. They could be a very, 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 very high vanity. They could be such a high Benoni that you for sure would be able to see the difference between them and a tzaddik. They could be like we discussed last chapter, the Benoni who seems like he's praying all day because he's so high and spiritual and connected to God on such an intense level all day. But he's still a Benoni. He doesn't have the soul power to be a tzaddik. Now, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said in 1991 that at this point, because Mashiach's energy is so dominant in our world, all the spiritual energies of Mashiach are already here. And as such, every single Jew does have now the potential to be a tzaddik. But in classical Tanya thought, as the Rebbe is writing this over 200 years ago, only a Jew who was born with that special unique ability could become a tzaddik. So is the Talmud right? Do we all freely choose to be God-fearing or not? Absolutely. And is Eev right that God creates the tzaddikim? Absolutely. Those facts do not contradict each other because tzaddik doesn't mean God fear. And God truly, until very modern times, hand selected those few individuals that will have the potential to be the tzaddik. Any questions on any of this? Okay, well, I see we're over time. If you're looking inside the Tanya, you'll notice that now there's almost like it's very unusual for Tanya because usually the chapter has absolutely, basically almost no punctuation, it's just straight till the end. And this chapter set off in two clear sections, which means we just finished the first section of the chapter. And next week we'll begin with the next section, which is really answering one question from the beginning of it until the end. It's almost like a little subsection within the chapter to be discussed is very interesting piece to be discussed next week. Um, does anyone have, we know we're just coming from Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a time as we discussed last week to focus on miracles. It's of course a very special time to be grateful to God for all the miracles God gives us. And God gives us so many miracles, big ones, small ones, things we might not call a miracle, but it really felt good. We're thankful, we're grateful. We feel God's love. Um, and the Bible Rebbe says that telling the miracles and acknowledging the miracles and thanking God for the miracles is a tool, a very strong tool to bring Mashiach. Because of course, by Mashiach, we'll all clearly see how everything is God's hands. And now when we share the good, we're inspiring ourselves, inspiring others, how, how God's hand is in this world today. 
So does someone have something they'd like to share? Last week, um, Eliyahu and I came back um, from New York. We drove. How was your road trip? To go, to go for the bris and everything. It's a long drive, but Hashem was with us and we didn't really um, meet up with um, any bad weather. The scariest part of the trip was the Dan Ryan. Oh, really? Over here. Yeah, really. Why? The traffic? The cops? Cars? No, cars fly and they. Um, they weave in and out and you're so tired, you know, so you're going to get home that like, you know, your, your nervous system is crazy. So, but you know, it was, it was wonderful to be there and, um, you know, it's sad to leave and so far we're healthy from, from all the people we came in touch with and everything. And we're very grateful to Hashem and to the Rebbe. For, for the miracles. How long were you there for? Um, I think eight days. Oh, wow. Okay, good. And the driving okay. and everything. So we were able to help out and stuff, but it's it, it's just such a miracle. Now you were very you were very lucky because there was such a, I, I was able, uh, I mean, I didn't even know that we're going to have such a huge uh, storm up in uh, New Jersey, New York. And I made my ticket for Tuesday and then Wednesday, it hits New York. So I'm here in Chicago and, uh, you know, I look at the news and I say, oh my gosh, like uh, people couldn't even, you know, open their doors. So you're very lucky that you got out of the area on time. Wait, so Sarah, did you drive through the storm or you left before? No, no, we left before. And it uh -huh. was a, another little, a, a beautiful little miracle. I have I have a friend for over 50 years. We went to Stern together and her nephew stayed in this um, hotel, uh, like a Marriott, a Homewood Suites. And he said it was impeccably clean. He was there in the summer. And that, and we then... I figured in advance, because we had a bench Manova Sunday night, that I would give them a heads up and ask. You can't just go, there's intricate um, sprinkler systems and stuff, and you don't want to, you don't want to make, you know, damage or fill Hashem. So basically, um, they were so special and so, like, so wanting to please us. They gave us the whole dining room, and we put foil on a table. A little table and we had like a travel menorah and Eliyahu bench menorah there and then we you know we, we grabbed the bite in front of the in front of the licht and it was it was really really nice that he even the, the guy on duty called the um, alarm company and said that he should put it in test mode in case it went at, off so that the whole fire department shouldn't come oh wow but, the truth is, if, if you're if you're forthcoming and honest with people, and I, I had arranged this like the Friday before to, you know, make sure that they that they would be masking to it. And they, they, they were so nice. Yeah, that's also a very big kindness. Doesn't always work out that way. That also was very kind of God that it worked. Very right. kind. So, you know, Chaste Hashem. I, I see um, more miracles all, all the time. We have to train our eyesight. We all experience miracles all the time. And we just have to train our eyesight and we have it, to remember- It might be part of getting older too. It's, it's also you part know. of the eyesight, the eyesight to see them and say, <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's, there's so much kindness of Hashem all over the world. And, and there's other things and we forget and things happen and we move on and we, you know, it's good to like hold it in your heart and remember it and think about it to really stay in that space of gratitude, to stay very, very, feels very close to Hashem. Does someone else have something they'd like to share? No, you just that like I said, you know, we planned our trip. Yosef came here on Monday. I came on uh, came on Tuesday, <laughs> and and then the next day, huge storm. And to me, it was a miracle. Otherwise, I would have gotten stuck over there. So exactly. it was. That's a chesed of Hashem. That yeah. I travel Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, whatever. 
And Hashem's like, this is all determined. I'm making sure you make that flight. So yeah, 100%. exactly. But sometimes oh, it Hashem. doesn't work out. We have to see the 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 hand and the chesed of Hashem also. True. Whatever it was is with whether it's an exchange with a person and you get disappointed or a, a doctor visit or what you know what whatever it is you, know, you have to look with um at least i'm trying to train myself to look with more mashiachic eyes that you know take a breath and and don't freak out true and i think that i think i think when we when we experience like rockle example your example we celebrate we rejoice and when we experience things that are hard for us, we have to have bits we have to nullify ourselves. We have to say, this too is God. And we remind ourselves, like for me, it's very beneficial to remind myself of all that good when I'm going through things that I don't like how they look and say, it's the same God. So the same way here, I see he did this, 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 and this for me to make it all work out. And I wasn't exactly understanding the process. And as it was happening, I didn't understand how that was better and how that was good. I just like went with it. And when the whole thing was over, I'm like, oh, wow, that was so kind of God. Guess what? This is the same thing. I know it's him. It's only him. There's nothing but him. And he's good and he's loving and he's kind. And this really hurts. But it's the same him. So when I have so strongly the miracles and the kindnesses and the warmth and the smile, I could like, you know, transfer with my brain and say, it's the same him that loves me so much and does all this for me. He's doing this for me. So I just have to have nullification and hold on and trust that this too will be an experience that I'll understand later, hopefully, how this is also part of the kindness. And if I don't understand it, it's also part of the kindness because it's the same God. His love for me didn't change. He didn't flip. He still loves me absolutely. And sometimes it's in a way I understand. And sometimes it's in a way that doesn't make any sense to me. But if I have enough examples that I understand, I could use them to stay strong the other times. Not that we should have the other times, but if we do, the more you can like pull out, of, at least for me, this helps me a lot. The more I can pull out of myself all those times when God was there for me, and including especially the times when I didn't understand what was going on, and only later I saw how it was all a divine plot. It helps me now. I had this. I had this literally yesterday. Literally yesterday, as I both saw like the whole divine plot unfolding. God was so kind to me, and at the same time, I was going through something very hard, and I, I was like taking one and transferring it to the other many, many, many times to like, you know, put myself in the right space. So thank God, after much, much, much work and many miracles of God, um, I was given through the government the funds to put up fences around our house, which is very necessary because my son Dover has tremendous elopement issues and it's very dangerous. So I got the letter of approval, Masay Rosh Hashanah. I said, wow, it's a sign. It's going to be a great year. And it was a complete miracle because they almost never, ever, ever approve fences because... They don't think you really need it. They think you're just, you know, pretending you need it. I don't know, because we really need it. Well, I guess God helped and they, they accepted it as true. Anyway, so then, I mean, I, I, it's not, it take a long time to go through all the details, but I was going back and forth between two companies trying to figure out which company to go through. Long story, I don't want to go into all the details, but I got a quote from one company, then I got a quote from another company, and I realized I preferred the first company to the second company, but the second company's quote was less. And I was like, should I change my order with them to make their quote higher? But I didn't do that. And then, of course, the, the government approved the lower bid, as of course I knew they would always take the lower bid, but they accidentally didn't write the name of the company. So I was able to go back to the first company and say, oh, this other company gave this bid and the, the government approved it, but I'd really rather have you. Would you match this bid because they're giving me less? You could also give me less. They said, fine, we'll give you less and we'll match the bid. So I went with that company. And in the end, they didn't give me less or what they were promising. Me, it's too complicated to explain. What they were promising me, they could have given me, they couldn't have given me anyway. And they gave me a much better fence than the other company would have given me. In the end of the day, I got a better fence for less money by sort of walking God's road and it just all worked out. And yesterday I was like, just so overwhelmed by how it all worked out. And it was such a gift of God 
And I was also dealing with something that was hard. And I kept saying, well, it's the same dot. And here it all worked out. It was difficult. There were lots of steps. There was lots of things that were not clear. But in the end, it all worked out in the best fashion possible. So too here. I don't see it yet. But so too here. It's the same God. It's the same love. It's the same care. Nothing is random. It's also exactly God. And it's exactly love. So that's why it's really good to celebrate the good so you could apply it when you need to to the other parts. Um, does anyone have anything else they'd like to add to that? Anyone have anything they've experienced they'd like to add to that? I had multiple miracles today. Usually I came when, yeah, when you ask, I, I don't remember any miracles, but today was a very special day. And you hear my husband playing the piano. Sorry for the sounds. So um, big miracles and small miracles, but it was amazing. Uh, starting this morning, um, saving me from the car collision on highway. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. And then um, I found the medical mistake, thank God. And the patient was, um, so I was able to fix it and the patient was okay. So like today was at least four miracles. <laughs> You know why that's I so interesting, to Minuha? Because today, it's so interesting that happened to you today, these four miracles, because today in 1987, my year could be off, anyone could correct me, I think it was 1987, um, maybe it was December of 86 or 87, and the Hebrew is Mem Zion. Um, two days ago, on what was Sunday to us, the 5th of Tavis, there was a tremendous victory in this huge, huge dispute. It was in the federal courts over the library of Lubavitch. And it was a huge, huge thing that took over a year. It was so painful. And it was such a, a spiritual fight. Just like, you know, the first Chabad Rebbe had his victory and the second Chabad Rebbe and the previous Chabad Rebbe. So this was this Rebbe's such a, such a fight such a such a, a prosecution, a spiritual prosecution that played itself out in the physical prosecution with absolute complete victory. A victory came on the 5th of Tavis, which was this year on Sunday. Two days later, well, the next day at night, which would be our Monday night, the Rebbe said that this day, meaning will be today, is just when all the gates are open and just tell people whatever they want to ask, ask. If you can go to the IHEL, go to the IHEL. If you can send it, you know, people send to 770 faxes, faxes, many, many fax machines were running all night, taking in all of these requests. And the Rebbe said, if you're in a place where you can't do this, just go to the closest grave of a very holy person and pray there. Because this is such a day when all the gates are open. Like whatever you ask, you're going to get. So I think it's so interesting that on this day, today, this is the yeah. day literally, is when you experience these four miracles. It's very powerful. Yeah, it is. And what, what was this car crash? Um, it was my fault. I was driving my husband's car today and I tried to fix, I got distracted. I tried to fix the radio to find some channels. So, and I didn't notice that the car in front of me um, um, was uh, stopping on the highway, it was traffic before entering the speed line. So, and oh, I noticed, thank God, last minute and I hit the brake. So it was very close, but thank God, Baruch Hashem, everything is fine. I'm safe, the car is safe. <laughs> totally my fault, yes. Wow, wow. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. Baruch. Is it too late to write in? No. <laughs> I wrote in. <laughs> I gave a no, very I, long, long, long bucket list. So, so I could still write in today or tomorrow? Better tonight to catch okay. the energy of the day. Yeah. I, I was thinking, I don't want to hijack, but there was this guy who, he was a Wall Street Journal guy, Daniel Pearl. 
and like in the early 2000s, sure. he, was be, he was beheaded. Sure, for being and, a Jew. And yeah, and, and the last thing that he said is, um, my father's a Jew, my mother's a Jew, and I'm a Jew. And he wasn't very, it seemed he wasn't so he wasn't observant, really nice. but. Right, right, he died on Kiddush Hashem, yes. Yeah. And yes, I was thinking so that, of him as I was saying it, the class tonight, but I just didn't want to get too off the topic. But yes, yes. Okay, down, so down, I, I took us there. No, no, no. no I, I, thought, I, thought of, I thought of it too, because, um, you know, he was somebody in, a, in his last moment or less it came to him. I was thinking that when I said that nowadays, that, you know, in previous times, people for sure all knew people that had died sanctifying God's name. And in our time, it's not too common. And then I thought, well, I thought of him as the example of someone we probably perhaps all have heard of who didn't have to tell them he was Jewish. And it's very possibly if he didn't tell them he was Jewish, they wouldn't have killed him. And he died sanctifying God's name. Absolutely. It's a violent a beheading. I mean, absolutely. 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 It's like the knee jerk instinct of the Jew. That's exactly what it is. But we should see the good. We should see Mashiach. The world's definitely going through the last birth pangs. I don't know. This baby's really difficult. But we should, it should just, we should hold on. And God should do his part. And we should just have the complete, complete, complete revelation of Mashiach now. Because... All of us are going through so, so, so much. The world's going through so, so, so much. And it's definitely God, you know, pushing, 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 pushing to, to get to this point of the complete revelation. And we should just have it already. And we will. I'm sure the Rebbe said this is going to be a great year. So it's going to be a great year. Thank God we know that. So when everything's happening, you're just holding your heart. No, the Rebbe said this is going to be a great year. So we're not going to have any fear. You know, it was the, you know, we're supposed to on Hanukkah look at the lights of the menorah and see what do the flames teach us? Like what message are you getting from the flames? And like many nights, I don't know, it was very busy. Like every time the candle light, it seemed like a very busy time. And a few times I try to look at the lights of the menorah, but there's always so much going on. I didn't really, but the last night of Hanukkah, I'm like, okay, this is my last chance. I'm just going to sit by the candles. I want to look at the lights and what is the message the lights are telling me. And I sat there for a long time. And every time I looked at the candle flames, I felt the same message. Very calm, very tranquil, very peaceful, very peaceful glow. I'm like, this is it. Every time I look, I get the same message. Absolute peace, absolute calm, absolute serenity. This is a message of the lights of the menorah final night of Hanukkah of this year. This was the message I received that I'm sharing. Just calm, tranquil energy. Don't worry. It's going to be very good. So we should see it and we should see it completely, completely revealed. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Sarah and Manucha, for sharing your miracles with us because we probably all have miracles and Rachel and just, you know, just hearing other people sparks our own and sparks that awareness of God so 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 with us every moment thank you so much thank for you thank Have you very video. much for thank everything you. thank you and thank you Manuha, for bye. sharing bye